we will start because everybody is incredibly punctual. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Uta Lehmann, and I am currently the director of the School of Public Health. It is wonderful to see so many people here on a 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. That is uh, unexpected and great. Special welcome to um, the colleagues from UCT, particularly uh, here. The first year, the OTF students are here in full force, which is fantastic. So welcome to you in particular. Welcome to some of the FBH students from UCT. Welcome to colleagues from the Department of Health, um, various other organizations. So it's really nice to have you all here, and of course, those of you who belong in any case. Welcome to you too. And it's nice to see some people here who I haven't seen in a long time, but Leo. Uh, he's become a very really great and really welcome guest. Um, so, this seminar is um, sort of opportuni opportunistically riding on the back of a week that, that some of us are spending in beautiful Montfleur outside Stellenbosch. Um, a co um, in, a, in a collaborative endeavor between the University of Western Cape and Umeå University in Northern Sweden. It's an emerging collaboration. We are discovering that we have a lot to talk about and lots of interests in common. So um, several of us, pre-docs, post-docs, docs, staff, I've been spending the week talking about various aspects of health policy and systems research, uh, accountability, governance, politics and power, and all things related to health policy and systems research. Um, and one aspect um, that is close to, I think, many of our hearts is embedded research, and we thought that is something that we could bring to a broader audience. So uh, we have a really interesting panel at the end. I will hand over to Helen and then to Tracy and Aline who will chair the panel just now. Just to also say this this collaboration, this group of people who is sitting in the at the moment um, consists of um, people from I think nine countries altogether, six different African countries and then we have collaborators from Guatemala, India and Sweden. So it's a really mixed and incredibly rich discussion. <coughs> Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more, more about the collaboration. Okay, then I want to tell you more about the collaboration. I think I've done a good enough job. And I then hand over to Tracy Naledi from the Western Cape Department of Health to lead the panel. And I think we will ask the panelists, panelists to come to the front. Yeah, just now. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Bo. Good afternoon. <laughs> this is meant to be interactive. <laughs> Hi. Um, hopefully, we will be talking to each other. And feel free to jot down your questions. I will make sure I give you opportunity for us to have a discussion and not have people talk at you. But before we start with the panel, which we will introduce to you in a little bit, welcome. Have a seat. Welcome. Um, we thought it might be a good idea to ask uh, Jill Olivia. Olivia, oh, you're a professor. I didn't know Jill was a professor. So, Professor Jill, yeah, who's going to really just give us just a, a basic understanding of what it is that we are talking about so that we can all be on the same page and you can jot down if you have any questions. Um, um, you can then ask of our panel and of Jill as well. So, Jill, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So yes, I have been given the unenviable task of trying to cover the entire field in 10 minutes, um, which is what I love to do. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just use that. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is in 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to try and uh, create some common ground understanding of what people are talking about in relation to embedded research, because there are lots of different perspectives and lots of different ways that people are thinking and talking about this. And this is based off a, a rapid scoping review that we've been conducting uh, for the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. So it's sort of the, the findings out of the literature review is, is where I'm going to be focusing on. 
So the term embedded research has gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. Um, it's not to say that it's a new idea. Um, there are people that have been doing what we are now calling embedded research for decades and centuries. Um, but it is a newly popular term that people are using. So for example, in some of the key WHO reports that have been coming out, the World Health Report of 2013, um, they've been talking about the importance of this thing called embedded research, particularly in relation to health systems research. And so there's this kind of increasingly popular uh, interest and engagement around this understanding of, yes, it's something that's really important, um, but there certainly isn't yet a, a, a same page definition for what it is. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a shared understanding that it's important, but there isn't a shared definition. And I know those of you from the clinical and biomedical sciences like definitions. And I have to tell you now, I am not going to provide you with one. So, so you'll just have to bear with me. But just to give you an idea, uh, these are publications that just have the word embedded research and health system in the title. Okay, and you will see in the last, there's 2012, 2013, 2016, and then there's been a flood of 2017s. Okay, people suddenly kind of just, I mean, this is just basically things that very clearly are speaking to what, to embedded research in health policy and systems research. So that's just kind of showing you what some of the interest is. So there are a couple of different ways of understanding embedded research. Um, this is from Gaffar from the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, which is at the WHO. He says, research is conducted in partnership with policymakers and implementers, integrated in different health system settings, and that takes into account context-specific factors, can ensure greater relevance in policy, priority setting, and decision making. So this is the sort of round terrain of what everybody are thinking, is thinking embedded research is and why it's important. This idea that research um, within health systems um, needs to be more relevant, needs to be more integrated into the health system um, so that it can have greater relevance and it can have greater effect on the health system. The other area that, that the interest in embedded research is coming out of is the broad terrain of work where people are talking about how the researcher, and I put the term there, you know, with quotation marks, because I don't want you to think academic when I say the word researcher. We're really talking about investigators. So that the WHO, I was just at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and there was like a day-long debate on whether they should remove the term researcher and put the term investigator. And eventually everybody said, oh, well, you know, actually, it, it, it is researcher. But it's researcher with a small r, okay? The whole variety of different people that are thinking about and strat strategizing and, and analyzing um, in relation to health system strengthening. But within that world, so for example, this is from the Shaker Hill paper from 2014, they say, all those engaged in research and analysis in health policy and systems are part of the web of actors and organizations shaped by social, political, and economic forces that together make up the health system. So this perspective argues that the researcher is part of the health system. It's not, the researcher isn't sitting outside the health system looking at the health system. The researcher them, researchers themselves are, need to be considered as part of the complex, adaptive, uh, messy, and sometimes slightly opaque health system, health systems that we are all part of. And when you start thinking along those lines, it starts creating a different way of thinking about how health systems research happens and where is it positioned and what does it mean for a researcher to be part of the health system. Now, quite what that means in relation to all of the models has not been clarified. So there's been some suggestions that research needs to be a new building block if you take the WHO building blocks approach that hasn't been decided or not. Um, is research an interaction in the health system? Is it a function of the health system? Is it an intervention? Is it an outcome? No one quite knows where to put research, although everyone's saying, yes, it's important. So there's some thinking to go on as to quite how research sits in the health system. But in the broader literature, there are some fairly common um, benefits that people are proposing for, for embedded research in, in health policy and systems research. Okay? And the one cluster of benefits is about the fact that embedded research should lead to stronger health systems. So there's a, there are two clusters of thinking. And the one cluster of benefits is that embedded research should strengthen health systems. It should have a health system strengthening effect. And part of this argument is that research should become a core function of every well-functioning health system, and that embedding the research would be doing that. There is a large cluster of uh, literature and argument about how embedding researchers into the health systems or implementers into research, so whichever way around you're looking at it, 
that this would promote the systematic uptake of research findings and evidence-based strategies into routine action, into routine systems functioning, whether you're focusing on implementation or policy. Um, but this idea that it would, improve the, it would improve the uptake of research and evidence into routine systems functioning. And there's a number of different suggestions given for, for why, or hypotheses given for why this might be the case. They say, for example, um, that that would result, would result from stronger trust between researchers and health systems actors because findings will feed more rapidly back into the health system. So it's about the speed of, of research findings feeding back into the health system uh, because critical issues will be more easily identified, um, will lead to actionable and usable res results, that difficult findings can be engaged in safe spaces, um, and all of those types of reasons, would, uh, all of those types of effects would uh, improve the uptake of research into the health system. There's also a number of benefits named, such as that it would lead to improved evidence-based informed decision-making. And this is a slightly problematic area because people, you know, around evidence-based decision-making, but there's a lot of literature talking about, talking about how embedded research can lead, lead to better evidence-based decision-making. Um, and a lot of arguments arguing that embedded research should lead to improved capacity within the health system, which would result in what we are calling a learning system. Um, so some people talk about an evidence culture within the health system, um, those, kinds of, those kinds of effects. And ultimately, there are a number of different studies, empirical studies, and different kinds of arguments saying that embedded health policy and systems research should itself have a health system strengthening effect. Um, and it's still, that is still being busy being unpacked. All right, so that's the one cluster of benefits. The other cluster of benefits is this idea that embedded research should actually lead to better quality health policy and systems research. All right, so that more embedded health policy and systems research will mean that more substantively relevant problems and questions will be identified if the researchers are embedded in the health system. So they will understand what the substantively relevant problems and questions are. Um, that there will be more in-depth or insider knowledge of the health system or context, including tacit knowledge. That at the same time, insider-outsider perspectives can bring fresh perspectives from the outside and the ability for some researchers to speak truth to power within the health system. That embedded research allows better access to people and information and it results in research that's less likely to be blocked by gatekeepers that there's better chance of observing routine systems functioning and that it enables the focus on people, which is so important in health policies and systems research, and ultimately should result in more responsive research. Okay? Are you with me so far? Okay. So how is embedded health policy and systems research framed in the current literature? And this is based on the scoping literature review that we did. Um, there's a number of different ways that, that it's busy being put forward. The one that I'm not going to pay much attention to is the more descriptive kind of saying. People say, oh, well, it's, it's inside something else, it's something inside something. We're not entirely you know, interested in that. There is a cluster of literature focusing on embedded research as socially and contextually embedded. So people will talk about how systems are embedded within systems and how systems are embedded within contexts. And there's a, a number of literature that frames health systems, embedded health systems research as that in, in that way. There's a cluster of research and, and publication which frames embedded health policy and systems research as processes for ensuring uptake of research evidence into health systems decision making. It's the one I, I mentioned earlier, all right? And in that cluster of literature, the main focus at the moment, driven out of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, this is their, their main interest and focus, is about institutions embedded at a macro level. So they're interested in researchers and research institutions embedded in ministries of health, for example. And that is their main focus. And the localization of research. So the focus on saying that we should be having local researchers and local implementers conducting research. There's a cluster of, of uh, interest in health policy and systems, uh, embedded health policy and systems research about specifically focus on implementation. So you'll see quite a bit of literature focus on embedded implementation research. There's a cluster, uh, as I mentioned, on embedded health policy and systems research leading to learning systems. So there's a couple of papers, people are trying to understand how, what that means and how, you actually, how it leads to learning systems. There's a focus on people. And there's a focus on embedded research approaches. So this understanding about how do you actually conduct embedded research. So those are the kind of ways that people are focusing on it at the moment. 
And I'm not going to spend too long on this, but there seems to be a bit of a split in the literature between people focusing on embedded research as a very functional, top-down, positivist kind of knowledge translation approach, and those focused on it as a relational, embedded, uh, participatory type of bottom-up uh, type of approach and, and action that you do. I don't want to spend too much long, too long on that. I just wanted to pause and highlight that when we're talking about embedded research and researchers, we're talking about a huge variety of different kinds of things. We're talking about insider researchers, which might be a, a manager conducting research in a health system. We're talking about jointly appointed staff, students doing their PhDs in their workplace or in, within the health system. We're talking about deliberate interventions where project staff get planted into the health system as part of the, this idea that, the, that their presence might strengthen the health system. We're talking about certain types of embedded NGOs who are deliberately trying to position themselves within the health system. We're talking about think tanks, committees. We're talking about the connection that academic institutions uh, seek to make with their local health systems, a whole variety of different kinds of things, which makes it a little bit difficult because in a sense it's easier if we say, okay, well, we're only focusing on this one type. But actually we're trying to understand a whole array of different types of entities that follow this, this, this embedded approach. So, okay, I'm not going to spend too long on this. This is just some, within the literature, these are some key characteristics that usually come out. People talk about uh, embedded research being positioned as an insider researcher, that it's very changeable, that it's interdisciplinary, it's highly relational, it's aligned with local priorities and policies, um, it prioritizes health systems decision makers, um, it's locally driven, should have local ownership, it should focus on inequalities, it involves the flattening of hierarchies of power. So these are some generic characteristics across over all of those different types. All right. And there are also some fairly generic uh, challenges across these different types as well. So there is an argument that, for example, there's a lot of pseudo-embedded research happening. So, for example, the WHO put out a criteria in a lot of their grants which said that um, certain grants had to have an implementer, a local implementing partner, and a researcher as co-PIs of the projects, thinking that this would encourage embedded research. But actually, very often, the, co the implementing partner was just a name on the application and never actually genuinely was involved in the research. There's a lot of gaming of the system going on. So there's some real challenges around how do, you, how do you get genuine embedded research going on? Um, there's a lot of discussion about how embedded research takes time. It's, it's not a fast type of research. It can be more expensive than the rapid kind of cross-sectional study that you can do in a month's time. It's about relationships and building trust and all those kinds of things that require time and energy. It requir requires some really specific competencies and capacities from researchers. And insider researchers can struggle to maintain objectivity. Um, and these, I think, are some of the things that might come out in the panel. They can get caught up in power dynamics and local politics. They might feel compelled to report more positively. They might find it difficult to evaluate their own interventions. They might find it hard to remain detached, especially when seeing something going wrong in the health system. Um, there are tensions around observation and experiential knowledge. Can you use it for your research or not? Can you discuss something that you discussed around the coffee, co coffee pot or in the kitchen as part of your research? And insiders can actually be blind to the things that are going around them because they're just the normal things that are going on around them. And so sometimes it's difficult for insider researchers to see, whoops, to see those kinds of things. And the last issue is that the a characteristic challenge of embedded research is that it raises really particular ethical challenges that very often our traditional ethical research councils just don't actually even know how to handle. So it puts a lot of weight onto the actual researcher um, to, to, to understand, um, to, to be able to make those ethical judgments in the field themselves rather than relying on standard ethical um, practices. And the other issue is that when you become more imbe embedded, you have more potential to affect change in the health system, but you also have more potential to do, to do damage. So the more embedded you are, the more likely you are that your research is going to have some kind of effect, and the more likely you are that something might go wrong and you actually might have some kind of unintended consequence, which really is an ethical challenge in this type of research. Okay, this is my last slide. So there are certain kinds of competencies for embedded researchers that are, that are being suggested. Um, it's being suggested that for embedded researchers, and again, I'm stressing researchers of all types, um, require specific skills in systems thinking, require particular skills and competencies in reflexivity, and in particular, this issue about trying to understand positionality. 
understanding positionality in terms of the researcher's positionality in relation to the health system is a, is a real skill, and understanding power and power dynamics is a, is a very important competency for this kind of work. It requires a critical perspective. It requires knowing how to act as an insider within their health system, which is a particular kind of, uh, of approach. It requires high levels of communicative capacity because of the relational nature of this work. It requires the ability to translate between groups because a lot of the literature talks about how insider researchers are the not become the bridge, the boundary spanners, become the knowledge brokers within a system. And so the skill for translation is very important. It's for researchers to know how to network and connect across groups and institutions. The ability to speak truth to power. A lot of the literature is talking about this capacity for ethical mindfulness. And again, that's that ability to, to make ethical judgments along the process rather than just at the beginning when you hand your ethical, um, your ethical application in. And of course, the ability to apply rigorous standard good research methods, the ability to negotiate complexity, change, and uncertainty. All the empirical examples of embedded research show it moving and adapting along the way. And you need to be the kind of researcher that can move and adapt with the system. The ability to, conflict, uh, to man do conflict management and facilitation and what people, a lot of people are calling reputational management. That ability to negotiate and understand um, how your research is going to impact on the reputation of the health system, of your institution, of yourself, of others, and the ability to manage that. And that's the end. Thank you very much.